And we probably could start with announcements. One that you may want to take note of. There is a congregational meeting immediately following this service. Lunch is buffet and will follow that. That will give us an incentive for focus and a timely meeting. So, um, yes. Any other announcements? Great. I want to thank everybody for all the work they did during the breakfast. We were successful. We don't know the figure, but we had a lot of people in and out of the church. Did a lot of work. We are a happy work crew, let me tell you. And they stayed to the bitter end, except for me. I didn't have to go the last day. <laughs> but that's okay. I was, my, I was myself, bossy. Any other announcements? Yes. Every year uh, in August, Valley Christian School sells pairs of peaches. And unfortunately this year, although a lot of sales have been made, the, the crops were lost. And so that represents a loss of profit to the school of about $15,000. And it's devastating for our little Christian and so um, we're looking for ideas for fundraisers, but also, even though you may not have children or grandchildren in that school, you may think it doesn't affect you, but that is the only Christian education that we have going on in this county. And so any way you can support them, we really do appreciate it. Any other announcements? Okay, can we still believe the Bible? No, let's just go home because there's really no sense to be here. Yes, then we have a job to do. We have a job to do. And it requires all our gifts and talents, time, treasure, mind, body, soul, and strength to devote ourselves to giving the message of this book out to a lost and dying world, and specifically to a culture of death. So, this is coming September 23rd, 23rd, Saturday. If you have anybody that you know of that says, ah, oh, the Bible's just a book written by people. I don't put any stock in it. Bring them. This is a world-renowned evangelical scholar. And not just a scholar, but he has a heart and passion for Jesus Christ. When I thought of inviting somebody, I thought, well, we did a DVD series earlier. Maybe we could try a live person, but it's going to be cost prohibitive. And so I tried my professor, and he said, you know, Nate, just pay me what you usually pay somebody, and I'll pay. He's coming. So let's have ourselves well represented. Let's talk to people and bring them here, because this is either a message of life, or it is not. If it is, our work is to invite and to bring, and to invite and to bring, and to speak on behalf of that empty tomb. So, uh, please mark that calendar. It is on the back of the bulletin. Uh, we have a free, complimentary, live interview with Dr. Blomberg that will hit the paper preceding this event by the editor, Andrew, and Dr. Blomberg. They're arranging that now. I've got that set up. We're going to have radio spots, for freebies in the paper, freebies on radio. Um, Roy has been giving due diligence and trying to help out in that area. We may be able to even have some paid advertising, but we don't know at this point. So please mark your calendars and come. And tell them that afterwards we're going to feed them. That will be Good point. Yes. Soup, salad, bread. Uh, both living bread. 
for the soul and living bread for the body. Saturday. Oh, you said what time? It's 10 to 12 and then uh, 12 ish and then we'll eat. Yeah. Now, for those of you who watched boxing last night or woke up to some news, and for those who don't know what boxing is, um, there was a fight last night. And I don't want to comment on the fight, but it did bring to mind Sugar Ray Leonard's statement when he was asked, how could you go so long and do so well in the ring. He said, I knew how the bout would turn out as to who showed up. And of course, the interviewer was thinking of the opponent. Not so. Sugar Ray Leonard said, if Sugar Ray the citizen showed up, I knew I was in trouble. If Sugar Ray the fighter showed up, Everything would go just fine. So, is the Bible true? Easy answer, if you're Bible believing. Yeah. What are the implications of this message being true? That's a good question. We have another event coming. It's on the back of your bulletin. It's a series. It is a Bible study in which we're going to cover the book of Galatians. It's called Scripture in the Sanctuary on the back of your bulletin. We're going to go through the book of Galatians, much shorter than Romans, and it zeroes in on the good news of Jesus Christ. How do you equip yourself for believing that the Bible is true? It is the Word. Luther was asked, how did the Reformation come to be? He said, well, I could have thrown the whole Western civilization into a civil war, but I chose not to. I chose rather to let the Word speak and let the Word act. And Mark and Philip and I would drink beer in the garden. Now, you might not like beer. That's fine. Back in Germany, it was staple. But Luther's point, don't miss the point. The point is that because the Bible is true, and the Bible self-authenticates, and it says of itself, it is like a hammer that breaks the heart of stone and creates hearts of flesh. Then if you are a soldier for Christ, you should know that book. So this is an opportunity for you. This is going to be a repeatable event every week, just in case you can't make the one you chose. Sundays from 1.30 to 2.30, right here, we will be going through the book of Galatians. Wednesdays, repeating that, 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. And Wednesday evening, 5.15 to 6.15, all three of those events will be Dr. Thomas Schreiner going through the book of Galatians. Digest the word if you believe it. There's a good, good behavioristic comment regarding people that say one thing and do another. And it's like this. I can't hear what you're saying because your behavior speaks too loudly. It's a profound statement. Here's a little promo of what this is going to be like. Galatians is a very challenging letter. How do you live your life every day? What does it mean to live by faith? What does it mean to trust God? What role does the Holy Spirit have in our lives? What, what's the historical context of the letter? Who, who are the opponents in the letter? What, what is the situation that Paul addresses? What, what is he uh, going against? What does justification by faith mean? I think the most important question in life is this, are you right with God? How do you stand before God on the day of judgment? There's always room to go deeper 
and, and the implications are vast. Uh, you're, you're teaching a Sunday school class on relations, and you, you want to make sure you uh, interpret it and explain it well. I think this course would help. I think this is uh, something that can be used by just ordinary Christians, even in your personal Bible study. And, and I think it's, it would be helpful for college students, seminary students who want, to, who want to take a course. I think you could learn more about Galatians, how to interpret it, how to, how to apply it as well to today's world. To, to read Galatians for yourself, to, to, to study it on your own, what, what a great privilege it is. And when you're reading the primary sources and you know the primary sources, you see the, the beauty of the argument, the logic of the argument, the theology of the epistle, you see yourself. I mean, there's nothing greater than that, I think, to, to, know, to know the material firsthand, not only intellectually, but also personally. So I'd encourage you to join me in this class and to learn uh, firsthand about the gospel. Coming to a church near you, this church, very near to you. Okay, we'll talk more about that as the weeks come. This is not an exam time. There are all kinds of materials. We're not going to have those. There'll be no testing and so on. This is a personal appetite, opening your heart to the world of biblical truth. It's very, very important. Okay. So, please stand with me as we enter the presence of God and let us sing, oh man and woman, give me praise. join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are here in your rhythm, in your appointed time, whereby in the simple means of human words and bread and wine, you have chosen to come and visit your people, restoring them, encouraging them, exhorting them, rebuking them, and lavishing upon them yourself. We are here, Lord, empty hands, nothing to bring but our need. Speak to us, each by name. Capture our hearts with your beauty. Instill in us an iron will and a passion that brings glory to you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. We practice here general confession, general remission, and please follow along. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is We'll have a moment of silence.
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, your Son's work of redemption is finished. Seated at your right hand, your Son now rules and reigns. Your people are indwelt with your very presence, making us your true sanctuary and temple. Your Spirit has come to renew and empower so that we may have consecration and devotion to the one true and living God. Though he has come, we confess our lack of response, our hardness of heart, and we bear witness to our own resistance to his rule and reign in our hearts and in the world. Therefore, we call upon you, O God, to break these hearts of stone and make them hearts of flesh so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And by virtue of that confession, dear Bride of Christ, dear Bethlehem of God, no longer must you live in the shadows of denial and brokenness. No longer must you play games with your conscience. Rather, hear and believe the gospel. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting your trespasses against you. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, continue to stand and let's sing together, Lead on, O King Eternal, number 119. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. And they shall sing by the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the high he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. Not forsake the work of your 
glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 51, verses 1 through 6. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him, and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look to the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will never be dismayed. The word of the Lord. The New Testament reading today is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, in the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. 
and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged them, the disciples, to tell no one that he was the Christ. So ends the reading of God's word. Please stand with me and let's sing number 138, The Spirit of the Living God. It of the Be seated, please. In the Romans passage, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, is what we will be focusing on.
There's so much in the liturgical readings that no person, however talented, could do justice to all the readings. But Paul exhorted Timothy to give himself to the public reading of God's Word. God's Word is powerful all by itself. And then God has appointed teachers and pastors and prophets in the church to, to augment and, and to clarify and to give direction. But make no mistake, reading Scripture is not just human words in action. It is God in action. It is the Spirit of God with the Word coming upon the heart of man and the heart of woman and breaking down barriers, sometimes by first attacking, sometimes by just waking out of a slumber. How could I have missed this for so many years? I've seen it like I've never have before. God still works. History is still unfolding, and God is still reigning and ruling. Now, a possible tie. Let me give you a broad outline of the book of Romans in one major way. Some have correctly noted that chapters 1 through 11 are chapters that deal with what God has done on the cross. We have said time and time again, these big words, which absolutely mean nothing that a three-year-old can't understand, but you may not be familiar with the terminology. The indicatives, statements of fact. Lightning struck over there. That's an indicative. God was in Christ. That's an indicative. Not imputing your sins upon you. That's an indicative but making him who knew no sin to be sin. That's an indicative. So that you might become the righteousness of God. That's an indicative statement of declaration, statement of fact. Now, chapters 12 through 16, people note that Paul has all kinds of application, all kinds of imperatives. Pass the syrup, pass the taters, Okay? Imperatives, commands, requests. That's what an imperative is. So, Romans chapter 1 through 11, indicatives. Romans chapter 12 through the end, 16, more imperatives. Now, having understood the structure, let's take a look just a little bit. Romans 12, 1 through 2. What does it say? Becky read, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Interesting that Christianity has honor tied in and through our bodies. Very interesting concept. Certainly would go against the common notion that Christians are pent-up sexual deniers who just talk about sexual sin all the time. Not so. The structure here is that there's honor in the body. And the honor of the body comes in to whom the body is given to service. In other words, what the body does. And you would be quite blind to say that the only thing the New Testament talks about is our sexuality, and you would be equally blind to say that the sexual mores in the first century are passe, and we don't have to abide by them anymore. That's a low view of the Bible. It's 
follows from the standpoint of, I don't care what the Bible says, it was just written by people. Yes, it was. And God used those people to give us in there some timeless truths. And so the body is connected with honor. Number two, what else does it say? Don't be conformed, but be transformed. And back up to verse 1, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Now, this is a difficult word to translate. It comes from the Greek word, which means logos, is the Greek word root word, and it means word, sometimes logic. And so some synonyms would be your mind, reason, would all be acceptable translations here. So we are to present these bodies which are given for honor, holy and acceptable to God, which is your rational worship. I, I could speak for a long time I happen to have an office next to some lawyers. And the bathroom, I'm in the middle between the bathroom and their offices. And it's terribly tempting to distract lawyers. And one is very fond who says, you know what? I've never grown up to like mechanics, auto mechanics. But if God said that I meet you under the car with the activity of being a mechanic, he says, I would devote myself to becoming a mechanic. Now, spiritual worship is fine, but it needs caution because we live in an anti-rational age. Schaefer said, the day is coming, fast approaching, when people are going to start taking upper story leaps. They're going to follow eclipses and sit on the top of mountains in California and hum, hum, and tap into the, may the force be with you. What force? Where does it come from? How do you know what's there? <laughs> Lawyers, doctors saying this kind of stuff, upper story leaps. But the sad thing is the church has let the culture down. The church has reconformed the church. God made us in his image, and we returned the favor. We made God in our image. And then, of course, churches for women and children. And all that school stuff, I'm not into that. You may not be. God is. He created you. That brain you have up here, that's his. He gave it to you. The one that can process mechanics is the one that can also read. And so therefore, which is your rational worship, your engagement of your mind, it is your spiritual worship, so long as you don't compartmentalize what it means to be human. Okay, number three. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your intuition, whatever you feel God is. I don't think so. Transformed by the renewal of your mind. Do you see what God has called us to? And the hardest thing in life, and I'm going down on home stretch here. Some of you may laugh, but we are not a young congregation. You might hear about that in the congregational meeting. The hardest thing I've seen human nature to do is to make an adjustment. We get all defensive. I see it with my kids, not me. <clears throat> We're going this way, and there's a call for adjustment, and I give people two options. Let me continue what I'm doing, or I'm going 180 degrees in the other direction. But God calls us 
to adjustments. God calls us to significant, transformative adjustments. And I am here to break news to you. It's going to involve some work and labor of the mind. And the church is not used to that. They like anecdotal stories, which are fine. But don't ask me to do things differently is the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges to human nature. Okay, possible tie. Possible tie to what? Let's look at Romans chapter 1, verse 24 through 28. It's not in your bulletin. You'll just have to follow along. Interesting. What do we have in the opening of Romans chapter 1? Paul is setting the stage for God's indictment against the Jews and for God's indictment against the Gentiles, which are non-Jews. FYI, that includes every human being that has ever lived or will live. Okay? Interesting. Ra Romans chapter 1, verses 24. Therefore God gave them up to the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies. Maybe Paul is pulling some stuff along as he lays out his theological treatise on God's revelation to him. So he could speak of us presenting our bodies to him in honor because earlier in the opening he said that sinful humanity was presenting, were presenting their bodies to dishonor. There's the beginning of the tie, Romans 1 and Romans 12. Number two, what did they do in presenting their bodies to dishonor? Yes, there were sexual sin violations there, but because they had given themselves to worship the creation. And what does Romans 12 call us to do? To present our worship, our reasonable service of worship to God, the Creator. And so in chapter 1, you have a dishonoring of the body, followed in chapter 12 of Paul's exhortation to the church to present our bodies in honor. Chapter 1, you have the dishonoring of the body coming from the fact that they worshiped created things and Paul calls us to present our bodies in reasonable worship. Joyful, rational, contentful worship. Number three, interesting. Paul begins to spin this out. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They became futile in their thinking. You see what Paul is doing here? He comes with God's legal indictment against every person that has ever existed or ever will exist. And he rains down on them the fact that they've worshipped, they've inverted the way life is supposed to be. They've worshipped the creation. They've dishonored their bodies. And now they have given their minds over to futile thinking. Fast forward to chapter 12, when God, when Paul then, after he lays out all what God has done in Christ, statements of fact, now begins the imperatives. And he calls us to honoring of body. He calls us to worshiping the creator, the one true and living God, who is a jealous God over his glory. And he will not share that with anyone, anything, no how, and no way. You see the tie, the apostolic tie that he has made. Okay, we've talked about the indicative of the imperative. Statements of fact versus moral commands. Romans chapter 1 through 10, interestingly, when you examine it grammatically, what do you see? There's a total of six imperatives in the first ten chapters of Romans. An imperative is a command. Pass me the taters. Pass me the syrup. Okay? There's only six in chapters one through ten of Romans. Five of those are in one chapter 
leaving only one for the remaining chapters, and they're all condensed in verses 11 through 19. And it's interesting, those imperatives talk about putting on Christ. Now, Romans 11 through 16. Chapters now, not verses. How many imperatives? A whopping 49 imperatives. In fewer words, fewer chapters, and Paul is now, he's taking what God has done, and he's now saying, what does that mean? for those of us who are in Christ. And now he'll begin to give commands and moral imperatives. And there's two heirs in the church, always has been. Oh, well, I'm saved, yeah, through my sticking to the fire. That's all there is to the Christian life. It's my ticket, one-way ticket to heaven, and I can do anything I want to in the meantime. The other error, that's called libertinism, not libertarianism, the political party, libertinism. My will is free. I can do what I want. During some of the earlier riots that we've had in this country in the past five years, some stood up and inscribed on walls or sidewalks, be not a slave to the state. Serve not the state, submit not to the state, submit only to your desires. Libertinism has infiltrated the church. Oh, everyone does this. So kids tell their parents regarding sexual behavior. Oh, everyone's doing it. I don't want to be a nerd. Libertinism. The other error is legalism. I got sent home if my hair touched the tips of my ears in school. I was told to tuck in my shirt if it wasn't tucked in. And then if I didn't have a belt, then I was sent home to go get the belt. Christians have turned the faith into stuff like that. You drink? You play cards? I mingled with Hutterites and Minorites very interesting folk. They looked at my buttons and they said, those are worldly. And he showed me his little hooks that were behind the piece of cloth. Legalism and libertinism. Oh, the balance of being a spirit-filled church following the impulse of the spirit to come after the word of God. 49 imperatives. Okay, so back to Romans 6, where all but one imperative is in chapters 1 through 11. The question, well, shall we persist in sin, libertinism? Can we just give ourselves over to what we feel? I mean, you know, let's go party. Let, let's go, let's go. Let us just let it go. Verse 2 in chapter 6, Paul answers that. By no, no, by no means in verse 2. Why? Because you have died, you were buried, and you rose in Christ. You are in Christ. It is inconceivable for someone who is in Christ to just give themselves over slavishly to whatever desire seems to cross their path. And if you haven't noticed, we're in a culture that says, I can speak as your pastor, Nate Johnson. And now you've got Mrs. Johnson because it feels good to me. Sad, sad that the church has drunk from these wells. Christ's death is once and for all in verse 10. So there's some indicatives. Christ died, was buried, and rose again, and so are you. And what does he do? Let the fight begin. Do not present yourselves as slaves to sin in chapter 6, verse 13. So here's the five imperatives that are in the first 11 books 
of Romans, and they center around what Christ has done. Because you died with him, because you were buried with him, and because you rose with him in your baptism, now do not present your bodies to dishonor. Rather, present them as slaves of righteousness. In the words of Bob Dylan, you got to serve somebody. You don't have a choice. That's what it means to be human, is to trust. Now, I hope you're getting the sense that there is a far cry from legalism and faithful obedience. And I hope you're getting the sense that there's a far cry from just doing whatever comes to you and being free and uncorked in Christ. You're free to be a servant now of righteousness. Before, you were not free to do that. You could only be a servant of sin, often cloaked in a form of civil righteousness, paying bills, mowing the yard, keeping your fence painted, neighbors just gawk at you because of your outstanding behavior. Her bread from Isaiah. You can see imperatives there. Verse 1, listen to me. Verse 2, look to Abraham. Verse 4, give attention to me. Give ear to me. 6, lift up your eyes and look. Imperatives. God has a message for us in his word. Verse 3, he says, the Lord comforts Zion. Now, in our text in Romans, I appeal to you. That can be translated, I exhort you. I, I call to you to come alongside me. I urge you. I implore you. I encourage you. I comfort you. All very wide range regarding this word here. Now you have to take context and, and try to narrow that meaning, but here in Isaiah, for the Lord in verse 3 of chapter 51, he comforts Zion. It could be that Paul says, I comfort you in my exhortation, in my call for you to obey, in my call for you to be attentive and to listen. I comfort you. With what? Verse 3 of Isaiah that Herb read. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden and desert like a garden. Thanksgiving will be found in her and the voice of song. There's the dance. There's the true regenerate heart living in faithful obedience and striving with all his and her might to conform themselves to what God has called us to. And God calls you to human flourishing. This is the big, this is the big elephant in the room that we have failed the church in so that the young people said, it's just a bunch of do's and don'ts, a bunch of legalism, a bunch of things that just aren't in vogue anymore. But you know what? God's commands are really tied to your flourishing. And that's what regeneration does. That's how the eyes are opened. And our call to, if we jump back to Romans, having gifts that God has given us and those gifts prophecy service teaching exhorting giving leading and mercy which one of those don't you like
And all of this flows, brothers and sisters, from one, one huge overarching fact. God visited humanity in Jesus Christ. God answered his own indictment with his son, taking that indictment upon him in the cross. And now he has a clarion call, a prophetic foretelling to the world. I have come. I have borne your punishment. I have borne my own indictment against you and have taken it upon myself to unleash you to mercy, to forgiveness, to getting out of your own ego. Luther said the number one effect of sin is incurvatus. It is a curving in on oneself, the prime number one trait of sin. Tell me you don't want to be that person. I'll believe you because only a fool would vote for that. Only a fool. In verse 3 of Romans, If, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think with sober judgment. Now, the Greek word there is analogia, which is according to a word which is defined in Greek thought as a state of right relationship involving proportion. That's what he's called us to, and I think the ESV does a wonderful job here in its translation. Don't think of yourself more highly as you ought to think, but rather think with sober Sober judgment. If the number one f effect of sin is to turn us in on ourselves, I will let people more eloquent than I speak to that behalf. A theologian that is past, James Denny, writes... To himself, every man is, in a sense, the most important person in the world and always needs much grace to see what other people are and to keep a sense of moral proportion. Another theologian, C.H. Dodd, writes this, A fantastical estimate of one's own worth, powers, or importance is one of the most radical and certainly one of the commonest causes of obliquity of moral vision. Obliquity is clouding. The number one thing that keeps humanity from engaging in proper moral behavior is the obliquity of our captivity to our own reflection, Narcissus. Back in the Greek tragedy, looked into the water and saw himself and was so caught, he couldn't take himself away from his own reflection. Are you caught in a narcissistic trap? It plagues all of us. The answer? Come back to God's indicative. He has taken you out of that dominion of obliqueness and has placed you in Christ with the clarity to esteem others higher than yourself, to not defend yourself, to not always defend yourself, but to think of others and to esteem and to encourage and to give yourself in service and generosity. Tell me that's not human flourishing. And I'll deny my own humanity. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let's stand and sing. <laughs> let's stand and joyously confess. It's a form of singing, isn't it? The Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit,
the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I have a new prayer quote. I leave them in there however long I feel like leaving them in. A form of pastoral libertinism. It's a quote by Spurgeon. I suggest if you don't memorize because you think you're too old, here's a nice one for you to memorize. Speak of it as you go to sleep at night. Speak of it as you wake up in the morning. Speak to yourself. Preach to yourself throughout the day. Because he's the living God, he can hear. Because he's a loving God, he will hear. Oh, brothers and sisters, what comfort I can give you. Because God is there. He is whom he says he is in all aspects. So fear not. Now we will go to him in prayer. For those of you who wish to pray publicly, please do so. Let us hear you speak loudly, and then I will lead us in the Lord's Prayer together. Coming, the floods are still continuing, and their houses are gone. And please just pour your spirit on them, Father. Amen. Lord, I want to thank you for all that you do for us as we've been talking in Sunday school about being a church of yours and in your nature, and, and within your guidance, we just pray, Lord, that you'll sustain that. That we can be a beacon to the community, and I also thank you that Roy Eaton is here today, that he has been ill and that you have restored him. Thank you. Amen. Lord God, I, I pray that you will point Valley Christian School in a way that they are able to obtain the funds they need to continue. I pray most of all that you will use the work that is done there and those teachers and the people there our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not in temptation. We will now have the offertory. This is a convenient and worshipful time to give of the monetary blessings that God has given you. If you do that by other means, that is fine. If you are visiting, please do not feel compelled to give. You are our guest. Enjoy the worship of God through Jesus Christ.
to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary, evermore praising you and singing, Holy, Holy God. Please be seated and join with me in the Agnes Day, the Lamb of God, the grand indicative of God, who has taken away the sin of the world. Lamb of, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Mercy.
on the night that our Lord was betrayed, as he looked at that grand indicative, that work that God was going to do in and through his Son, he gathered his disciples and he took the bread, the simple sustenance of life, and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And when he took the cup of blessing, he had given thanks. And he had poured the wine. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This drink of it all of you in remembrance of me. And with those few but solemn and profound words, Christ has given us himself to feed us in the rhythm of the Lord's day. May I have a few elders to assist in the distribution, please. If you are our guest, this is the Lord's table. It is not ours. It's not Presbyterian. It's certainly not Christ Reforms Presbyterian churches. It's the Lord's. You've recognized that you're a sinner. Christ is the atoning sacrifice. And you've come to him without any merits of your own. Then he wishes to give you himself and to speak of you and to bless you with his gracious, kindly presence. There are some gluten-free wafers for those of you who are needing that. Um, and so whenever you want, just come out of your seat and please come. Please stand and join with me in our closing hymn. You are sent forth. Number 66. of this 
That one stanza is all we will do. Please give a warm thank you to our visiting, gracious giving, Bonnie Rice for coming today to help us out. We're finally on all cylinders between she and I, so uh, uh, it is going better. Don't forget a congregational meeting. Take a five minute break, be back here. We're gonna be focused. I think the session has done an amazing job. This should be easy.